name is Josh Kirby and I'm here on behalf of PSA and we are here in Columbia to introduce the sport of PSA, which is Protection Sport Association. Uh, within PSA, I'm the Secretary of Decoys. The sport of PSA uh, originates in America or United States and it's about 24 years old at this point. It originally started off with two clubs in North Carolina that went back and forth as far as trying to compete with each other. And since then, over the last 24 years, which is not that long, it's grown throughout the United States, it's in Canada, it is in Europe, it's in South Africa, it's in India, Australia, Vietnam, it's all over the world, and now we're here in South America, in Colombia, which is amazing. Mi nombre es Carlos Morales. En este momento estoy aquí porque estamos participando de la creación de un nuevo deporte en Colombia, que se llama el PSA en base a otro tipo de deportes que tienen más tradición como el IGP, el RIM francés, el RIM belga. La idea es que en Colombia podamos crecer, podamos tener varios clubes que podamos presentar en los Estados Unidos en un futuro para que el deporte comience a formarse y podamos tener aquí pruebas que es lo importante para poder eh, mostrar lo que es este deporte. In the beginning, it was mostly dogs that were sport dogs. They were, they were dogs that were being trained for personal protection and they wanted to compete in some way. They wanted to see who had the best dog um, or who could, who could win a trophy. It was a competition for the dogs. Now, there's all kinds of dogs in the sport. There's, um, there's working police dogs, there's competition dogs. And as far as breeds, there's lots of different breeds in the sport. And it's one thing that I love about PSA is we don't discriminate by breed. In some sports, you can only have certain breeds. Um, and in PSA, you can have any breed that can do the sport. Obviously, some breeds are more successful than others. We practice PSA because I think Everyone loves dogs that does this. We enjoy the training. We enjoy the competition. We enjoy how hard it is. A lot of people might come to PSA from another sport because they're intrigued about how difficult it is. And that's a challenge for us as dog trainers. I love decoying. If you're not familiar with, with what that is, that's the guy or girl on the field that is being bit by the dogs. Uh, I love that part of the sport. It's, it's what I enjoy the most. A partir de hoy, 25 de marzo del 2024, Con este proceso y esta certificación de hoy estamos creando el deporte, porque esto se trata, esta certificación, de, de crear unos hombres que se llaman decoys, que ellos son los que van a trabajar el perro y van a hacer una función especial dentro del trabajo de protección. Entonces, ellos, ellos, sin ellos no hay deporte. Entonces, lo primero que tenemos que tener es los decoy. Una vez tengamos ellos, ya podemos comenzar a trabajar nuestros perros. La certificación nos da que pues, ellos ya pueden trabajar y están certificados para poder mirar la forma como se maneja el perro, porque la idea es que el perro ni sufra, o sea, que se pueda trabajar bien, que no haya ningún accidente y tampoco con las personas. Entonces, el decoy es el encargado realmente de velar por la seguridad de todos y porque se haga un buen trabajo el perro pueda realizarse, pueda mostrarse como debe ser. Entonces, eso nos ayuda muchísimo y eso es lo que realmente nos necesitamos para poder trabajar. So, there's two phases to protection sports. There's um, the obedience phase and the protection phase. In the upper levels of the sport, the decoys are on the field for obedience, but where, where they're more is a distraction for the dog. In the protection phase, that's where the dog is actually sent to bite us or apprehend us. And we're doing scenarios that may be something um, that the handler might encounter in real life, like a carjacking um, or an attack on them. And we are simulating being the bad guy in that situation. And the dog is defending the handler. What we, what we try and do with dogs is we try and um, train them to the point where even if there's a weapon, they're not afraid of that weapon. Right? They, they're still going to engage the decoy or the suspect or the man. Um, and we want them to be courageous. We want to build up their courage to where they can go apprehend someone even if they have a weapon. And the gun doesn't mean anything just because it's loud. It doesn't mean anything to the dog or the stick. They're not afraid of those things. Most dogs would be afraid of those things. 
Dogs, the way we train dogs is got, dogs shouldn't really react to the gunfire. They don't know what a gun is. They don't know what a gun is the way we do. What it is to them is a very loud noise that uh, may get their attention um, or scare them, hopefully not. Hopefully it's not scaring them for the dogs that we're training, but it's just a loud noise. Um, and they don't know that that is a gun that could potentially hurt someone, but it is something we have to work through as far as training. We have to train the dog to be neutral to that, to not be afraid of it, and go engage a decoy that might have that. Se necesita para este deporte muchísimo control del perro y, y la obediencia tiene que ser casi perfecta. Entonces es lo más importante. A la vez de combinar una buena presa y una agresión del perro para, para poderlo trabajar y, y que realmente sea un deporte que figura protección. El perro, eh, el cachorrito, por ejemplo, es muy importante trabajarlo, que se socialice y que tenga en medio ambiente. Para esto, pues hay diferentes cosas que deben manejarse como distractores y, y una buena socialización del, del cachorro. Para eso se necesita tener un grupo de personas, además de salir y, y sacar el cachorro para que se socialice en, la, en, en diferentes ambientes. Pero sí, claro, necesitamos de decoy y todo para ir trabajando desde cachorro la mordida del perro, porque el perro disfruta muchísimo la mordida. Es de las cosas que más le agrada a un, a un perro. Entonces nosotros le damos esa satisfacción a los animales que puedan obtenerla y a la vez que se vuelvan tranquilos y puedan eh, disfrutar del, del diario vivir. So I started in PSA when I was a police officer in Texas and I was a canine handler and I heard that there was a dog competition not far from me. So I drove over there and I started watching what was going on and I was very impressed with the levels of dogs that I saw in the field. Um, I arrived during PSA level three, which is the highest level. And I was so impressed, I started asking everyone, you know, who's, who's doing the training over here? Where can I train with the, these people? And I started training my police dog and some of the other police dogs in my unit with the PSA trainers because I was so impressed with, with how well they did things. So this is a while ago. I'm a retired police officer. Um, both of my police dogs that I have, um, or I had when I worked, have now passed away. So my, my competition dog right now is just a PSA dog. So my dog's name is Brew. She has her first leg of her PSA 2. Um, I love her. She's also my pet. Um, I, I don't just look at her as my competition dog. She's my friend. Um, she's, she's my buddy. She goes lots of places with me. If I'm watching Netflix, she's right there watching Netflix with me. Uh, right now, because I'm in Colombia, she's at home with my wife, keeping her safe. So she's also my protection dog at home. And my wife is very happy that when I travel and I'm not at home, she has Brew with her because she knows someone comes in the house, you know, to do something they shouldn't be doing, Brew is there. De las cosas más bonitas del deporte con los perros y en general, en general pues, no solamente en este deporte, es compartir en familia eh, una actividad. Mm, yo les quiero contar que bajo mi experiencia, compartir con mi hijo y, o con mis hijos este deporte es algo que no tiene comparación ni tiene ningún valor económico. Esto le da a uno lo que es la vida, la, la realidad de lo que es uno fomentar una relación hermosa con los hijos y con la familia. No tiene comparación, la verdad. Con mi hijo, con Juan Pablo, comenzamos muy jóvenes en varios deportes. Cuando él cumplió seis años, nos iniciamos, entramos en artes marciales y así fuimos compenetrando porque la historia mía era tener alguna actividad con mis hijos. Luego estuvimos eh, practicando golf y por último terminamos en los perros y ahí ya no salimos de ahí, de ahí, ahí no nos salimos porque encontramos también un amor especial de los animales hacia nosotros y nosotros hacia los animales y eso nos da como un triángulo eh, entre, en general en familia que hace que la vida sea más hermosa y que podamos apreciar el medio ambiente y la naturaleza. A lot of people think that if a dog is trained to bite, that no one can be around them. There are some dogs that are like that. For what I look for in a dog, I want a dog that can do that, but can also act like a pet um, when we're not doing the work. That's what I look for. We call that more of a social dog. I want a dog that you could come visit me in my house. And as long as I tell her that it's okay, 
she's okay with you and she's happy to see you. Um, I want my dog to do the job when I ask her to do the job. So lots of dogs in the sport are like that. They are also people's pets, um, but there are some dogs that maybe aren't able to do that just because of how they are wired genetically and they are more of a work dog that need to be treated like a work dog. Realmente el, el perro cuando termina su actividad ya eh, retirado puede estar en cualquier, eh, en cualquier familia o con cualquier persona, no tiene ninguna cosa especial, simplemente es darle cariño, conocer al perro y tal, porque son perros sociables realmente, aquí nosotros no buscamos perros peligrosos ni perros que vayan a causar un accidente. Como ustedes se dan cuenta, aquí puede todo el mundo estar y aquí no pasa nada, no hay accidentes con los perros. Lo que se quiere es que realmente se haga con mucha seguridad y, y, y ellos son muy sociables, o sea que no tiene ese problema, a pesar de lo protectores que son. Uh, advice for good training would be um, enjoy, enjoy your training with your dog. I, I love seeing handlers that enjoy engaging with their dog and their dog is happy in training. I love seeing a happy dog and a happy handler. So I try and encourage people to enjoy their training. You know, don't take it so seriously, enjoy it. Why, why would you be doing a sport, which is a hobby to us if you don't enjoy it? So just have fun with your training. Usually sometimes when the dog is biting, um, sometimes you'll hear some noises while the dog is biting. A lot of that is aggression. You know, you might hear some growling. That may, that's, that's aggression is what that is in the dog. Um, so when we train, we're taking a dog that has some genetic aggression and we're controlling that aggression and using obedience and, and control to like perform tasks with that dog. So we're taking a dog that is well suited for this sport and well suited for this type of work and has a genetic predisposition to do this work well. So all kinds of dogs can train for this sport. What we mostly see in PSA is Belgian Malinois. Um, German Shepherds are very popular, but there's all kinds of breeds. I know there's a Border Collie. Um, there's been lots of, there's, do, there's plenty of Doberman in the, in the sport now. Um, lots of different breeds, but mostly what we see is Belgian Malinois. Pues generalmente son deportes de protección. O sea, si hay ciertos balances en, en algunas categorías que por ejemplo, se identifican como perros pastores, hay perros de, de, pues, de diferentes razas, pero generalmente pues aquí trabajamos perros de protección, perros más grandes, perros que tengan ciertas habilidades para, para la defensa. Es muy importante porque pues, es un deporte de protección. A mí personalmente me gusta mucho el pastor belga Malinois o Malinoa, porque es un perro que es muy ágil, muy elástico, muy eh, activo, es un, tiene una muy buena guardia, y es un perro que, que, que tiene mucha velocidad y mucha agilidad mental. Esa agilidad mental le da a él una característica de ser un perro muy rápido en el aprendizaje y, hacer, y, hacerle compla y lo complace a uno muy fácilmente. Hay otras razas que son, todas son muy buenas, todas tienen características distintas, pero en general esta raza ha sido la que más me ha gustado. El pastor alemán es muy buen perro también, pero pero pues, el, se me, pues en mi concepto es mucho más rápido el pastor belga y por eso pues lo prefieren en, en cierto modo. Te cuento que yo he hecho IGP y, y practiqué rin francés. Esas dos actividades, en general yo pasé un perro de, de IGP, lo pasé a rin francés y de rin francés estoy pasando otro perro a PSA. Eh, no es difícil, pero tiene características distintas. Un perro ya adulto, pues es más complicado porque ya tiene unas características ya establecidas dentro de un deporte. Es preferible coger un perro más nuevo para trabajarlo e iniciarlo dentro de este deporte. So if you if you decide to try and do a sport like PSA with what we would call maybe an, we call that an off breed, a dog that's not common in the sport, you would have to have a, a dog that was maybe like a one in a million in that type of uh, breed, right? You've made it very hard because that dog's genetic predisposition is not for this type of work. So it is hard to do and it takes good training. It also takes a very, very special dog to make that happen. Um, but as far as developing grip work, it's something that we do with dogs, most dogs that are being trained for this sport. We do that when they're very young puppies and we're just teaching them to bite rags you know, at the very beginning. We want to develop grip work and then eventually as they get older, they're working all the way up to biting me in a full bite suit. <laughs> This guy's this tall and we're trying to make her jump up here to bite. 
but she did bite the leg really well. She enjoyed biting the leg. She's lower to the ground. The leg is naturally at her height. So as a trainer and as a decoy, I think it's smart to like allow her to bite the leg. That's gonna be the area that she bites. And she did it well, she enjoyed it. She did a good job. So if I was training Skye, I would keep her on the leg. She did a good job, I loved it. When people see a dog that is not common doing this, we're all excited about that. In my opinion, I think the best uh, breed for PSA is the Belgian Malinois. Um, we consider that the, the fast sports car of the sport. Um, the dogs are naturally very, very good at this sport. They're, they're agile, they're fast, um, they bite well. Uh, they're very, in my opinion, easy to train because they want to please and they have very high drive. So that's a great, that's a great dog for this sport. I see smart dogs in all different breeds. Um, the, the Belgian Malinois seems to want to like go do the task and doesn't think about it as much. All right, that's also good because we know they'll go do the job and not think about it as much um, sometimes, but it just really depends on the dog. I've seen very, very intelligent Malinois. I've seen Malinois that aren't so smart. And then the same with every other breed, whether it's a German Shepherd, a Doberman or whatever else, it's just like us, right? Like there's intelligent people and people that maybe aren't so intelligent. Sometimes when a dog bites, it might accidentally bite its tongue, just like we would bite our tongue when we're eating food sometimes. Sometimes that can happen. The other, other thing that could happen is just like us, sometimes our gums might bleed when we're brushing our teeth. When the, when the dog puts its mouth on, on a sleeve over and over, maybe the gums will bleed a little bit. No one's really modifying the dog's mouth at all. What you might run into is with an older dog, um, just over time because they are doing a sport where they're putting their mouth on a human, those teeth may, might crack over time, just like our teeth do. There may, there may be some dental issues, and sometimes you'll see some, some dogs that have uh, teeth that are capped, just like we do. Um, but that's not, that's not something that a lot of owners go do to add to the dog's mouth or anything like that. We're using the, the mouth that God gave them. Yep. So when we compete with our dogs in PSA, we're, we are being scored by a judge. And we have a score sheet so we know what is expected from us. And um, maybe if the judge has asked us to heal with our dog, meaning our dog is gonna walk next to us, we might lose some points if the dog got out of position or maybe like fell behind a little bit. The judge might take some points for that. So everything we do on the field is being scored by a judge. And when we're done with the, with the routine or the competition, we get our scores and we find out you know, what our score was, whether we passed. And then we also get to see, because it is a competition, we get to see, are we first, are we second? That's the fun part of this. A lot of the judges that are in PSA have a long history with PSA. They've probably been handlers and competed at a very high level and done well, and they're very respected in the sport. Um, and the other side of that too is they could be decoys like me, um, where they have been in the sport a long time and they're, they've done a good job and they understand the sport very, very well. There's some judges that are actually both. They were very good handlers and they're also very good decoys. So our judges are people that we want to have been in the sport for a while and also been successful in the sport because if they're gonna critique people, they should have a very good knowledge of what they're critiquing. So they are ranked, so to speak, in that they earn titles. So at the, at the beginning of the sport, we have a certificate that you can earn called the PDC. The next level is PSA 1, followed by PSA 2 and PSA 3. PSA 3 is very prestigious. There's not a lot of dogs that have achieved that because it's so difficult. So if you have a PSA 3 dog, a lot of people might have the name of their dog followed by PSA 3 to signify that they've earned that title, which is quite an honor. In PSA, we don't give points for what the dog looks like. What we care about is how the dog works. And that's what we're getting points for. So we're, we're here for, for dogs that are um, working dogs and performing a task, and that's what we're being judged on. Um, as a handler, you've achieved that with the dog, and we consider the dog and the handler a team. So if my dog has achieved it, I've also achieved it. We've, we've done that together. We're a team on the field. So you can train your dog in whatever language you want. It's one of the things that I like about PSA also. We're not um, very, very strict on certain things that probably don't mean a whole lot. Um, you know, if you say sit in Spanish and I say sit in English, 
It means the same thing to the dog if we've trained it that way. So it doesn't really matter what language it is. You could, you could potentially train your dog in a made up language. As long as you were able to say, this is what my language is and this is what it means. And there's lots of people that um, do fun languages, maybe a language that they don't even speak, just for fun. We were talking the other day about um, a handler that did a dog in Japanese. Um, Sean mentioned yesterday that his dog is, is in Irish, or I believe probably maybe Gaelic. I don't know what, what, what exactly the language is, but he trained his dog in a different language, which I think is fun. Um, I know dogs that are being trained in Hebrew, which is great. There's lots of different languages that you know people don't speak maybe on, on their um, everyday life, but they're training their dog in that for fun. So one of the things I love about PSA is that the scenarios we have are, even though it's still a sport, they are very realistic. Um, we have a carjacking scenario where the dog defends the owner in the car. Um, some of the surprise scenarios we have might be where uh, um, a bad guy or a group of bad guys come out and attack the handler and the dog defends them. So that's what makes the sport fun is that the scenarios that we do could be real life situations. And a lot of people that compete in the sport of PSA also consider their dogs their personal protection dog. <laughs>